when we speak about the modern sources of Muslim law, it can be categorized into customs or urf, judicial decisions and legislations. Customs are never recognized as a source of Muslim law, but sometimes referred to as supplementing the law. Muslim law includes many rules of pre-Islamic customary laws which have been embodied by express or implied recognition. But the Prophet Muhammad said that let the customs not be a source of Muslim law. He recognized only two customs as a source of Muslim law. The first one is a dover and the second one is divorce. Dover is something that is paid or given at the time of marriage to the girl in marriage by the bride or by the guardians of the bride. Whatever the dover that was given to her at the time of marriage would come in the times of needy for a girl. She could make use of it for her herself exclusively without sharing it with anybody. And this also acted as an indirect check on the absolute right of divorcing his wife. That is, it acted as an indirect check on the husband to divorce his wife unconditionally. And the next one is talaq. This was the custom that the Prophet approved to be continued forever because under, under Muslim law, the purpose of marriage is to enjoy the conjugal bliss. That is, marriage can be defined as a civil contract for the procreation of children, uh, for the legalization of the intercourse and the, for the procreation of children. And Prophet Muhammad says that if there is no compatibility between the husband and wife, there is no point in compelling them to live together. That is, he says that it is, it is easier or better to release the beasts than to make them or to compel them to live together. So he said, let these two customs be followed for all time to come. But for these two customs, Muslim, Muslim law does not recognize any other custom. Next is judicial decisions. The most important judicial decisions which act as a source of Muslim law are Shabani Begum case, which is called, that is between Muhammad Ahmad Khan versus Shabanu Begum, which is popularly known as Shabanu Begum case. Under Muslim law, the moment a lady is divorced by the husband, she is, observe, she, she is supposed to observe a period of iddat for three months and the husband is liable to maintain her only during the period of iddat, but nothing beyond this. But section 125 of CRPC very clearly says that irrespective of one's religion, a divorced wife can claim maintenance from the ex-husband as long as she is not married. This was the principle put forward or put forth by the court, by the Supreme Court in Shabani Begum's case. Next case is Katisa Umma versus Narayanat Kunhamu. In this case, the Muslim husband had gifted his property to his minor wife. The minor wife did not have any other guardian but for the mother because of which mother accepted the gift on behalf of the minor daughter. But under Muslim law, there are other, uh, there are proper guardians for accepting the, uh, the property on behalf of a minor in which the mother is not included. The uh, husband dies. The wife also dies. Now the mother of the minor wife wants to claim the possession of the property. At this juncture, the brother-in-law or the brother of the husband says that when the mother accepts the gift, she is not a proper guardian because of which the gift is not complete. But in this case, the court has given a ruling that in the absence of any other guardian, mother is also equally competent to accept the gift on behalf of a minor. And the Sarla Mudga versus Union of India, this case relates to the conversion from, uh, from the Oswe religion to Islam. And in this case, it was clearly laid down that 
uh, when a person gets converted to Islam only be with the intention of get, taking the advantage of a particular provision which is not there in their uh, original religion, conversion will be held struck down and whatever the actions or whatever the deeds that are done in pursuance of the conversion is, will also be held invalid. And in the case of Maina Bibi versus Chaudhary Vakil Ahmad, this relates to the widow's right of retention. And it very in this case, the Supreme Court, the, sorry, the judiciary very clearly stated that once the lady loses the possession of the property which, which she was retaining in lieu of the dover, she loses it forever and she can't ask for it back, even if the dover amount is not fulfilled or it's not made up. The last source of Muslim law under modern sources is the legislations under which Sharia Act plays a major role that is 1937 Sharia Act was passed. Section 2 of the Sharia Act very clearly says that customs have no place to have uh, no uh, cannot be a source of Muslim law and section 2 says that as far as marriage, dover, divorce, uh, inheritance and work fund uh, these things are concerned Muslim law will be made applicable. For the first time Muslim law was reduced to writing which is called Sharia Act. And another act is Chayamara Restraint Act. Under Muslim law, a man or a person, can, both a boy and a girl can get married the moment they become 15 years old. That is, we say that age of puberty. But the Child Marriage Restraint Act very clearly says that a person, a boy below the age of 21 years or a girl below the age of 18 years are not or do not have the capacity to get married, do not have the capacity to consent for a marriage and such marriages are irregular and such marriage will amount to the child marriage which is barred by law. So this has an implication on Muslim law. Even if they are Muslims, they will have to follow the Child Marriage Restraint Act and any person below the age of marriageable age, that is 21 years and 18 years, boy and a girl respectively, they cannot get married even if the customs, their customs permit them to do so. And the next one is Dissolution of Muslim Marriage Act 1939. For the first time, a woman was given the power of divorcing his, oh, sorry, her husband on the nine grounds uh, as enumerated under this act and Muslim Work Validating Act for the first time, 1913, for the first time a family work was validated that is this act said that family work for private work is also valid as long as it uh, as long as the it says that the ultimate god sorry the ultimate owner is the god and then guardians and watch act 1890 it says it speaks about the appointment of a guardian and this also has a bearing on Muslim law or this also becomes a this overlaps or this camouflages or this overtakes the, 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 the dictum which is there in Muslim law. That is legislations which is the last part of modern sources might have been contradictory to the tenets that are there in Muslim law but still they are of general application. These legislations are applicable to everybody irrespective of one's religion. So this, these are the primary sources and the modern, modern sources of Muslim law.